So can you tell me about who you are for a moment? So I'm a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm the deputy um, head of the experiment of CMS and the elected next head of the experiment. We go, the title of the exper uh, experiment head goes as spokesman, as you know, or spokesperson. But it's an executive position, it's not a communication position. So how did, how did you, uh, how'd you get here? That's a good question. <laughs> I have been um, in particle physics at collider, Hadron Colliders, like the LHC, um, from, for actually many, many years, since about 1987. I was involved in the SPS, which was the uh, big accelerator here where the W and Z were discovered. I moved to uh, the Tevatron at Fermilab. Mm -hmm. um, after having looked for the top fork here, I wanted to go to the Tevatron and find it there. Yeah. And I joined CDF and I led the B tagging group that actually had the strongest signal of any group at the Tevatron in 95. Part of the reason uh, that, that um, we had such a strong signal is that we had a micro vertex detector made with silicon strip sensors. And these are very thin wafers with fine strips on them and you can get a very, very, very precise position of where the particles pass through these wafers. You can project those back to the origin and you can see if they don't project back to the beam line, meaning that they came from some particle that traveled away and it decayed. And that's how we were able to see the Bs, okay, which were crucial to finding tops. Because okay. top quarks always decay to a B and a W. And that was a big new addition to hadron collider physics that I had gotten excited about. So I worked on that at the Tevatron, then I led the silicon detector center at Fermilab for a while and built some big silicon detectors for the CDF experiment. And finally, someone came to me from CMS and asked if I would help build the silicon for CMS. And I ended up then leading the construction of about half of the, uh, the tractor. Okay. And that went, that went very well. And then the spokesman at the time uh, like my work, the deputy then became the deputy spokesman at that time became spokesman and asked me to become deputy physics coordinator. Uh, and that was in 2007. And then the next spokesman, current one, Guido Tonelli, asked me to be deputy to him as spokesman. So sort of um, a number of things. You, you kind of build up your reputation over a long time in these experiments. And then uh, you rise to one of these positions. Then they burn you out and you go back down to the heat. <laughs> Can you give me a very brief explanation of the standard model? It's basically a model that describes all of the fun almost all of the fundamental uh, particles and interactions that we know about. One piece that's missing is gravity, which is very hard to incorporate in a quantum theory. And the standard model is all quantum field theory. There are three main forces that we think of. One is electromagnetism, the other is the weak nuclear force, and then there's the strong nuclear force. And those three are described in the standard model. In fact, two of them are unified. The weak nuclear force and electromagnetism turn out to be sort of the same, different aspects of the same thing if you look at the higher energy. So it's always kind of seemed to me, I mean, like from a very layperson standpoint, that quantum mechanics is uh, so weird. You know, it's, it's explaining something, it's not the explanation. Quantum mechanics is, is really, believed to be complete. We're tempted to say, you know, like Einstein, that God does not roll dice because quantum mechanics is this probabilistic model of, of the way of, uh, you know, you describe processes in, in terms of probabilities, not in terms of anything definite. And that really bothers us that we cannot predict things definitely. And there, there are things like Bell's theorem that explain that, yes, this is it. This is how it goes. You can't go beyond this. I have to say that I often question that myself and and wonder if, um, you know, if, if, if somehow, you know, we're, we're really living as a projection in a smaller space and we're not seeing everything, you know, that, that, that quantum mechanics might be an effective theory inside of a bigger theory. But I'll tell you this, most theorists will not really entertain those discussions. <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing here is going beyond quantum mechanics, getting sometimes beyond quantum field theory, and trying to understand, um, you know, really the basic structure of the universe, whether there are additional dimensions. You're working in Europe, and you just alluded a little bit that, you know, different particles are called different things in different languages. Uh, is, is language a barrier for you? Not generally. Um, because I've worked at CERN off and on a lot in my career, 
um, I actually studied a lot of the languages. So I know Fr I'm fluent in French, I'm fluent in Italian as well. I can get, understand Spanish pretty well. With romantic languages, I have a good shape. Everyone speaks English. Ah. Um, <laughs> that helps. So that helps us a lot in a way. It also makes it very hard to learn a foreign language. I've been hearing that the Higgs is, is dis un like disprovable. Like you can say it doesn't exist. There's an experiment that we can do and then we'll know. Um, that seems unlikely to me. It seems very difficult to prove that something doesn't exist. So it depends really how you phrase it. And, and we can phrase this, the question that way. So the strictest form of the standard model of Higgs has very, very specific predictions. Right. Really down to them, we can predict them to incredible precision. We don't know the mass of the Higgs, but for any given value of the mass, we know exactly what would happen for the standard model of Higgs. But so that guy we can, put out of its existence. If you go into much more um, exotic models, possibly true models of, of what really goes on in nature, it, it's possible that we would miss it. But when people say we can rule out the Higgs, they're talking about a specific item, the standard model Higgs. And that in itself is a major, major thing. We've known for a long time that the standard model is not the end of the story. Right. But this would kind of really put a nail in its coffin. What else is missing from the standard model? You said gravity. There are five things we know of that are missing besides gravity. The fifth one, I must forget. <laughs> <laughs> you can sit here like, like me occasionally thinking, my God, we've spent so many years of our life, I spent 15 years preparing this experiment. What if we don't find anything, you know? It doesn't work that way because we know there has to be something that's got to give. And the reason is we know that there's dark matter. Mm -hmm. We don't know what it is, but it's huge. I mean, it's 30% of the universe. It's more, five times more abundant than normal matter that we know and love. It's 30% of the universe, but only five times more than normal matter. What is everything else? Exactly. Almost everything else is dark energy. That's 70%. We are definitely in the minority. <laughs> normal matter is only 4%. Well, you say that, but I look around and I'm only seeing normal matter. That's right. That's right. I feel like right. I'm in the majority in my, here in my office. And that's because we don't interact with the rest of it, and that's the problem. So I mean, here, it's, it's right in your It's not like it's, hanging out somewhere else. It's everywhere. It's very like everywhere. Dark matter in particular, um, we don't know. I, I can't even talk about um, dark energy because I don't know that we have any good idea of what it is. Right. For dark matter, we have actually many candidates for what it could be. Because this is certain particles that don't interact with normal matter very much. They're super weakly interacting. So you could have a ton of it passing through your head right now, and you wouldn't feel it. Doesn't it have to have mass in order for it to have... It has mass. Sure, sure. It just doesn't interact. What's holding you from falling to the center of the Earth right now? My chair. It's really mostly electromagnetism. Of course, what's holding the chair together. Yeah, the, the electrons so, pushing together. It's almost all electromagnetism, and that's super strong. Compared to gravity, it's, you know, unbelievably strong, right? So we know gravity, there's dark matter, we know there's dark energy. Those two combined cover 95% of everything that the universe is made of. Then there's the fact that neutrinos have mass. The standard model doesn't uh, predict that. There is the fact that the universe has had to have a, have a period of inflation. And then there's this a-causal connection from one extreme to the other, where if you look in one direction in the universe and look in the opposite direction, these regions should not be in any way have been able to talk to each other. They should be causally disconnected, and yet they seem to have a lot of correlation. But there are these five things that we don't know, and then there's, there's the connection to, to gravity. And so there has to be something else out there. I, my group is, is looking for dark matter, a uh, dark matter candidate. I think that's a very exciting way to go. The Higgs will be very interesting, obviously, if we find it or don't. Either way, it's a major result. Would a larger collider allow you to find more? Higher energy would have helped a lot. To get to the energies that we need to, we have to go to a very intense beam. And that, that means that when we uh, when the beams cross, many pairs of protons interact, which is a bit of a mess. And if we'd gone to higher energy, um, we wouldn't need to go to such high intensity. That was part of the attention of the design of the SSC. The SSC would have been a great machine, and you know, um, could have helped, but I think what we have here at the LAC is adequate to probe a huge amount of the, the phase space. And the LAC can also be upgraded someday with stronger magnets to get to energies close to what the SSC had planned. So we may get there anyway, but um, right now we're sitting in a region which is very, very exciting, even at half the design energy. We're already able, as you see, uh, if you know the results that have come out, that we're 
we're very close to nailing down the standard model for these reasons. So next year, we'll, we'll be able to say something definitively. We will find it, but we don't. If we find it, then we have to study it. And the details may tell us a lot about where to look next. And if we don't find it, although it would be hard to explain this to our funding agencies, it's a much more exciting situation. <laughs> Where you get to you get to make up your own particles that have your name on them. Well, maybe it could be some interesting. Uh, who knows? I very much appreciate you taking the time to talk to me this evening. It would be great for people to keep tuned and um, and see what we come up with, and hopefully it'll be something surprising and quite exciting. Well, great. Thanks, Joe. Take care.